all share the responsibility for aviation safety. Before the break, we met our panel of experts on pre-flight actions, aeronautical decision making, and loss of control. Our panelists will discuss how to avoid surprises in flight through a multi-layered safety approach to avoid hazardous situations that can lead to an accident. We'll begin with an in-flight scenario. The owner-pilot of a Cessna 185 had previously flown the aircraft for several hours without any control anomalies. He had taken his aircraft to an aviation maintenance technician to have the strobe light power supply replaced. Subsequently, the aircraft was loaded to maximum gross weight with the center of gravity at its most forward allowable position. No safety of flight concerns were discovered during the pre-flight inspection. On this post-maintenance flight, the owner was allowing another qualified Cessna 185 pilot to operate the aircraft from the left seat, while the owner occupied the right seat. The before takeoff checklist was followed and trims were set to their proper takeoff positions. Upon rotation, the left seat pilot asked if the aircraft had always flown nose heavy as he struggled to hold on to the control yoke. Both pilots began applying aft elevator pressure while assessing the situation. They repositioned the elevator trim to the full nose up position with no noticeable change in the nose heavy condition. Working together to maintain aft elevator pressure while one pilot also managed the throttle, they were able to land without incident. Sounds like these pilots were very lucky. What was the actual problem here, Steve? Why did these pilots struggle with elevator control? During the replacement of the strobe power supply, the elevator trim had been moved beyond its design limit. This caused damage to the elevator trim actuator, jamming the elevator trim in the full nose down position. Even though the trim actuator was damaged, the trim indicator was still operating. So what was missed during the pre-flight that could have prevented this near accident? Was this just an incomplete pre-flight? Was it a legal pre-flight? And why wasn't the issue caught? Katrina, this was a legal pre-flight that had the potential to become lethal. The pilots conducted a complete pre-flight and positioned the trims in accordance with the checklist. Although the trim was jammed, the trim indicator was still able to move, giving the pilots a false trim position indication. So how could applying an advanced pre-flight have prevented this near accident? The pilot stated they had set the trims during the pre-flight, but they did not visually confirm that the trims themselves were actually functioning properly. Many pilots perform pre-flight checks of this trim control by operating the trims while not verifying their actual function outside the aircraft, which includes the direction of travel. If you apply the concepts of an advanced pre-flight, this is how pilots should check the elevator and trim controls. Well, having that added knowledge about pre-flighting an aircraft would have been an excellent first layer of defense in this situation. What would be your take home message from an incident like this? First, conduct every pre-flight inspection as if you're unfamiliar with the aircraft. Second, always use additional caution when pre-flighting after a maintenance event. As our trim example reveals, a maintenance action that seemingly has no bearing on other aircraft systems, in this case the trim, could have led to an accident. And third, pilots who rent aircraft should treat every pre-flight as if maintenance had just been performed. You just never know what has been done to a rental aircraft since you last flew it. Well, thank you, Steve. Those are some easy and reasonable pre-flight tips for us all to remember. Since this near accident had a positive outcome, let's look at what pilots did right in terms of aeronautical decision making and flying the aircraft once they realized they had a problem. Janine and Rich, once the issue with the trim went undiscovered during pre-flight, what might the pilots have done differently with regard to aeronautical decision making and aircraft handling? Well, Katrina, obviously the pilots worked well together to bring the aircraft back safely. From an observer's standpoint, it appears the pilots divided the manual workload with both pilots applying back pressure to the yoke while one of them also managed the throttle. This kept the aircraft under control. In a case like this, it is extremely important to communicate clearly and specifically to the other pilot what is going on. For example, the flying pilot would want to say that the aircraft is extremely nose heavy and how much force it is taking to keep it flying. Also, if they were at a controlled airport, they would want to declare an emergency and keep the conversation with air traffic control clear and concise. I agree. Of all the possible jammed control scenarios the pilots could have encountered, nose down is potentially the most difficult. Working together and not giving up, the pilots did the best they could under rather demanding circumstances. That said, too few pilots consider what they would or could do to fly an aircraft that has jammed controls. For example, 
slips and slipping turns become important and necessary skills to counteract jammed ailerons, a jammed rudder, and split flaps, or perhaps an asymmetric thrust event in a twin-engine aircraft. In the case of a disconnect of the elevator control system, many pilots are unaware that certificated aircraft are required to be controllable through landing by using trim and power alone. Of course, it takes training with a qualified instructor to be able to fly and land an aircraft without using the primary pitch control. So it sounds like the key take-home points from this scenario are always pre-flight as if you are unfamiliar with the aircraft, remember to aviate, navigate, and communicate clearly and concisely, and no matter what, fly the airplane using whatever controls are available to you. Let's take a short break, then we'll analyze the chain of events that led to a loss of control event that did not end so positively.